Next up we have uh, Steve Wong. Uh, Steve Wong is uh, with DXC Technology. He's, uh, you guys are very, uh, many of you are familiar with Steve. He's um, an award-winning entertainment technologist who enjoys putting first ever disruptive technology in the hands of billions. Uh, Steve aligns and integrates the technology view with the business view, provides an integrated practice, thinking, methods, techniques, and processes to guide decision making and facilitate governance during the transformation cycle. Steve was recognized with a 2007 Primetime Emmy Award for Outstanding Achievement in Engineering Development for the Terranix uh, Video Computer. Steve is a member of Interactive Media Peer Group of the National Academy of Television, Arts, and Sciences, the Emmy Awards. Uh, in addition, Steve is the Hollywood Section Treasurer uh, of SMT. Uh, for fun, Steve writes and produces independent feature films. Um, Steve, where are you? Come on up, join the party. Hey folks, how are you? Uh, first of all, I used to be the treasurer. They have had new elections, so I would move on to that. There you go. Let's see, the controls here. You got a cue. Pardon the Photoshop. Okay. So you heard a little bit about blockchain, and um, this is interesting how it's infused itself upon Hollywood at this time. So I'm not going to talk about digital currency. Okay. That's not what we're going to talk about. We're going to talk about the underlying technology, the true uh, blockchain. And as you've seen, a few folks have initiated patents in blockchain in the media and entertainment industry. Like my friend Eric uh, with DRM, you can see Verizon that has some blockchain patents. Um, there's also a, a number of other things going on. You've probably seen that um, Warner Music has a, instituted a blockchain solution for the digital rights and the music, and actually Sony announced, Sony Music announced that last week. So blockchain is something that our community, and I say our community, um, because we're in the entertainment community, that, that we're embracing on, on a few points. So I, based on that, how many folks in the room are involved currently in a blockchain project? And uh, we have one, two, three, four. That's impressive, actually. So we went a few years ago when we were talking about this general technology to folks now that are actually using it in some form. And I think that's a positive, positive vote. And of course, you've, you've all seen this. You know, all of a sudden, the, the investors and board members are talking about blockchain. So they say, oh, let's hire a blockchain consultant, and everything has to be blockchain. The reality of the situation is, instead of just talking in general terms, let's really dig into the, the guts of how we can use this. So we all remember this, right? I mean, how many folks have actually cut film in this room? I know this guy has. So they we're really not that far along from where this was, and some folks still love to shoot on film. Um, then we actually went to editing on film and sending these big cans around. And at the bottom, you had these guys. Uh, and they were re basically recording in the general ledger. Who showed up on set? Who checked in this day? Who do I have to pay? What frame is that? Where is the bin of that? And of course, the most important guy registering on the ledger, the guy at the theater. What do we sell this Thursday night? What do we sell on Friday for tickets? Reporting that back so everyone gets paid. So we've always used general ledgers, even though the technology has changed. Now we have these you know, lovely Aria Alexas with digital. Uh, we edit on Avid's you know, again, a digital medium, and we're storing stuff in the cloud. Some of us using Amazon and Google and whatever. And some of us, some of us in this room perhaps, are now using bots and AI to go through scripts to determine what, what is a good script, what is a bad script. Some of us are using AI at the edit level to determine where we should edit this. And some of us are using, even using smart contracts so when we order that production truck that the grips have the right you know, stuff and a number of Apple boxes in there automatically because we already have a contract with them and we have that rate negotiated. And some of us are actually using distributed ledgers where we say, okay, 
you know, we agree that this transaction happened, and a number of us also agree on that. And some of us that are really going to the edge of technology are using this peer-to-peer -peer model where we're saying, instead of having you know, everything in the server to render, we're gonna render it a bunch of PCs that are around the world, uh, sort of like AWS, but with on a PC-to-PC -PC basis. So, in summary, we, we see this. Blockchain exists. You know, now in, in our industry, we see blockchain storage, we see blockchain CPU, we see blockchain bandwidth. So it's here. Um, is it better or worse? We're going to see. So why now? We got two things here. One, our viewing habits, as you know, everyone in this room has changed. Um, and second, our audio listening habits have changed. You know, one of our clients is Universal Music, and right now, more than 50% of their revenue comes from a new model, a digital model. So the world is changing. This is the other big change you guys are very well aware of. In the old days, you had a handful of folks that used to control everything that we all saw on the theaters, on the television shows. That's no longer the case. These guys right here, the analysts determine what we watch. If it's not profitable, if the companies don't have year over year growth, quarter over, quarter growth, things change. So the world has absolutely changed. So one of the possible technologies that we talk about is blockchain to handle some of this. And you know, again, we'll get into more detail. It's a peer-to-peer -peer network. We're using cryptographic hashtag functions, and we're using public keys in this entire process. So I want to get into the details of how, and some of us, some of you have seen me do this. Um, how this works in our daily, or could work in our daily life. See, I write a script, right? I get it copywritten. So that, in my view, that's one way as the beginning of this blockchain, because I want to control this and make sure I get paid along the route, but also to have some reference material. So I'm going to use an animation example. So I take my, my, my script, it's recorded as that first step in the blockchain, and now I want it, you know, I go to my storyboard, obviously, we're going to start that. So that transaction of me sending the script to that storyboard artist gets recorded. So I have evidence I sent to this guy so it doesn't mysteriously appear somewhere else. Storyboard artist gets done with each one of those, those frames, sends it down to the camera department to do some mocap. Each one of that, those drives um, gets marked from what camera it is and what server it's on. Then it goes up to the animate department. Those animation guys, each one of those versions get locked into the blockchain. So as you can see, this continuation from the script all the way through the process, any change or any transfer, we, we look and we record it in a general ledger in essence. And that way the entire thing, everyone knows what version and who has what at that point. So again, th this is an important process that you know could be done with a database. And when we're looking at blockchain, we, we take a look at you know, which one do we use? Do we use a database or we use blockchain? Um, if you control everything and everyone trusts everything, use a database, it's cheaper, right? But if any of this process has to occur with, you know, contractors that don't necessarily trust each other but they have to work together, in other words, a definition of a movie or a television program, <laughs> then, did I say that? Um, then the, probably a blockchain would be an interesting solution. So again, I, I get into the, the specifics of this. So say I write my script, I send it to my agent. So the script will, will be encoded with a, my public key, send it to my agent, Alice, who has a, a uh, private key, she unlocks it, she can read it. She doesn't have it, she doesn't read it. She can't send that to anyone unless they have a key. I'll tell you an interesting story. So a friend of mine's an agent, and he represented you know, a pretty big actor. And his wife wrote a script. And he said, well, you're a friend of mine. You're a longtime client. I'm going to give you the script to see if you can do it. The guy says, oh, th this looks interesting. Let me send it to my manager, see if he approves it, and I'll do the show for you. Um, all of a sudden, the manager gets it. He sends it to some friends. And lo and behold, a few months later, NBC comes out with the exact same show that looks really, really similar. A few things changed. My friend calls up his actor client and says, what's going on? He said, you know, I can't do the show, I didn't want to do it, um, but apparently my, my manager had someone else that did something similar. Again, right now there's no way to track that. With a system like this, you can, you can track it, 
and you know give your you know give your attorneys evidence to go in court and and uh, proceed with it. So again, if we go down to production, I'm shooting a show. My uh, my uh, Dave is taking those files and he's transferring it to post production. The same sort of thing. Dave encodes all those files, sends it to Kim, the editor. She needs her private key to unlock that before she can edit it. Everything's recorded in the blockchain. So two simple examples of what that would look like. So on a higher level, and we'll come back down again, this is a process of where we have an on-chain, again, people that are directly involved with, say, the production, and the off-chain, some of the folks that are tertiary involved in the production, you know, third-party vendors. It might be, um, you know, the catering company or other folks that you need to tie to that particular event, but we can do something with them off-chain. And I'll get into a little bit more details on this. So when you look at Hollywood as a business model, it's not just one blockchain. The way we envision this is multiple blockchains tied to that particular piece of content. So, so you have the big six studios, they would have a, a private blockchain. So those voting members would determine you know, who comes into the blockchain, what content, like the example here, scripts come in here and what gets processed. But along this side, you have some side chains, okay? And PAA to govern, you know, the folks on who comes in and who comes out of this, perhaps. You have the side chains, the guys that cast and crew or entertainment partners that are negotiating and bringing in the entertainment part of that or EM, BMI that are doing rights. And the other side chain is maybe your auditors that are determined that everything is correct here. And then say you have the public chain if you want to, you know, distribute it, you know, to the to the end consumers. So all, all related, all tied to multiple blockchains, but really tied to that original piece of content that I talked about. So the other really interesting thing about blockchain is a the new ability to use microservices in this process. Um, we'll, we'll get to some depth of this in a little bit. But imagine now I have this blockchain, and I'm not dealing with the individual server, but I have multiple servers out there, and I can do these on, you know, basically microservices workloads, either editing or compositing and anything else like that. Using a blockchain system, we, we can tie these together that would go out to, say, nodes. And again, I'll get into this more detail. Those nodes would process, say, like a rendering and be able to get compensated for that uh, through the process and coming back to a completed process. So think of on this, right now I'll just put a pin in it, say think of D apps, distributed applications. So again, in the old world, if you looked at the far, your far left there, um, you know, there was like the AS 400 days. You had this big supercomputer, we'd all tie to it, and that was in our data center somewhere in our thing. So today we're more in this cloud sort of native thing where all the applications are on, uh, you know, Amazon or something else where they're coming down to the applications. This, this next world that I'm talking about is um, this dis distributed processing. Just, uh, basically, you look at the applications now in the data center, they're coming from the data center down to the ISP. This, this new world based on the blockchain is this distributed application where all these, um, in essence, almost like a peer-to-peer -peer network, are processing this content. So you, you can think of it, on re I think rendering is probably the easiest application to think about this, but basically any application could be done like this. So again, instead of processing one place and sending it out, it's distributed processing all over on these distributed uh, devices. And again, everything linking back to that piece of content, so you're, you're, you're uh, rendering a movie, uh, it's all tied to that blockchain that I that talked about later on. The other interesting thing that we can do with this blockchain in this process is um, sort of like crowdsourcing. Again, we go to this application and say, okay, we have um, you know, a bunch of folks that want to work together on this particular movie. Uh, they don't necessarily trust each other, um, but we want to pull them together. So again, it leads to uh, a blockchain application like this. So this could be artists that, that are animating, this could be colorists and everything else bringing them together in this movie. So what this does is it really puts together a different type of business model. You know, right now when you make a TV show or movie, everyone's got their IATSE, SAG, and all those agreements, and you gotta pay everyone up front. You know, some, you can see some of these indie movies that will say, hey, come on and, you know, help me put together my movie, and if I get picked up, I'll pay you, you know, in the future. 
which never happens, by the way. Uh, so don't act in a movie that tells you that or do camera work. Um, but blockchain allows you to do that without any question. Because if that gets picked up, you know, you're tied to the blockchain. And so you get crowdsourced to edit this movie or something else, and it does get picked up. Everyone knows exactly you know, who gets paid on what. So again, the blockchain allows these interesting business models for this changing Hollywood. The other interesting thing, you know, I talked about distributed compute. When we look at this and we think of, if I'm distributing compute around tying it together with blockchain, I can tie it together with IoT devices also. You guys will remember back a few years ago, I think it was last year, when we had this huge DDoS attack, basically took down the, 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 the internet. It wasn't from you know, two hackers. It wasn't from a bunch of computers around. It was from a hacker that basically put this small program on a bunch of you know, IoT devices, cameras, security cameras. So imagine if you're processing change for post-production where it wasn't just in your data center, it wasn't just an Amazon cloud, but if you can harness the, the uh, compute power of the entire IoT world, you know, almost a billion devices out there, just split your processing up. Again, blockchain allows that. If you take a look at this, you know, the basics that we understand now, we have virtualized machines. Applications run on VMs. That, that's a fact. We have the ability to do a peer-to-peer -peer network platform with a blockchain. So in essence, your computer is the network. So all the, instead of buying a server with a bunch of cores, you know, you're, you're having this compute power over the entire world of these IoT devices through a, you know, P2P uh, networks or blockchain as a service on this type of thing. So the question is, have we found the golden ticket? Did we solve all of our problems in Hollywood? Yes. <laughs> you know, no, maybe. Um, I think we're at a starting point to ask questions, and that's good. We've got a bunch of folks, even in this room, experimenting with blockchain and doing things with it. We have a, a great technology. Um, you know, for, for my company, um, we have a, a lot of companies uh, in, in the banking world that are experimenting with blockchain um, really defensively. Um, but it's interesting what, you know, my banking clients are pushing with this. But, but also our other um, clients like Procter & Gamble, they're doing it on a production flow. So I thought, well, if, if big companies like that, you know, the Fortune 200 that we control, their, we run their IT systems, if they're thinking like that, if they're producing, you know, things like that, why wouldn't Hollywood do this? Because we're producing, in essence, a bunch of sausages, the same, you know, production process. So, as, as some of the folks mentioned earlier, there's absolute limitations. And we're going to jump into these a little bit. Scalability, you've heard about that. Confidentiality, which is interesting because that's what blockchain is. It's everything is shared. So not necessarily confidential. Access to external data, transaction costs that Eric brought up, 51% uh, attacks, soft and hard forks, and of course, like any database, garbage in, garbage out. This is one of the, the first points that, that, that people bring up, and, and it is a concern. It's scalability. So as Eric said, um, you know, blockchain does about seven transactions per second. You know, our client Visa, you know, we do about 1,700 transactions per second. But post is different. Remember, we're, we're not, at this, uh, talking about post-production, we're not going out to 100 million consumers. You know, we're talking about a few post-production houses. We're talking about a few titles per year. So, you know, that transaction per second is probably less important to us, but nevertheless, we have to address it. So there's a few ways to, to take care of that. Something we call sharding. In other words, when you take a look at the blockchain, not having everyone determine if, you know, that we did this particular transaction and everyone recorded. We take a portion of it and we put it off to the side and we say, you know, we're gonna have these folks determine, you know, if, you know, to take a look at this, you know, was, did I send my script to my agent? You know, and a few of those folks say, yeah, that, that happened. The other way to do it is increase the block size. Right now, it's a, you know, one meg per block. If we increase that to two, that, that sort of helps us. But that introduces other challenges you know, with a network, if you double the size of something you're putting through, you're going to slow it down and have other challenges. The other thing is delegate consensus pools. 
Again, we saw how you know, the, the big six will probably say there's gonna be a few of them determine what's in the blockchain, that sort of delegation. Um, maybe, you know, I take it down to a set level. So maybe you know, everyone that appears in the show, um, you know, that's uh, you know, you know, actors, cameramen, all that, maybe not everyone determines you know, who checked in that day. Maybe it's the production manager and a few other folks that say, yeah, all those folks came in. So by, by breaking it up into parts like that, you sort of help that speed and scalability. This is, this is a challenge, but, but this is a fundamental challenge, right? So confidentiality, part of blockchain is, you know, you have a shared community where everyone knows what's going on. Some folks may not want that. It's like, like our banking clients, they don't necessarily want that. So the, the way to do that is a few things. You know, Hyperledger Fabric basically breaks that up in, in sort of like the, the Hollywood model. You've got a few folks that determine, you know, who sees what in it. So I'll give you an example. So you, you do an independent movie and you've got two big actors and all the press is out there and they all get $20 million, but the reality is probably not that, right? Uh, and they're probably represented by the same agent. Um, but actor A doesn't, you know, you don't want the towel, you know, on what they're really making. So that's where you would have a, a system like this where the contract would be uh, confidential in, the, in this hyperledger fabric, only giving a specific access to who needs to see it on this particular point. So that's, that's uh, one of the ways to get away from the confidentiality. So again, as I said, blockchain could be divided up into what the public sees and what a specific group sees. This is a, a big thing that I think gets overlooked a lot. Um, blockchain ex ex access to external data. Because again, with, with blockchain, uh, we have these um, transactions that are recorded and they're kept in the block. But what, what if we wanted other information related to this, right? Say we had, you know, again, we, we were putting together this crew and part of them getting paid is based on what the ticket sales were of this particular movie when it gets out. Right now, there's no way to get into that unless you add something what we call oracles. So the oracles would basically be open to the outside world of what those ticket sales are, what the record sales were, and basically put that in to that blockchain. So again, that challenge, but there, there are solutions. Uh, this is uh, one of Eric's points right here. Th this is really a critical thing. And when you look at blockchain, I think you've got to really look at it holistically and say, how can this really uh, benefit production, okay? It, you can't just look at it, hey, I'm gonna sell my movies to somebody, okay? Because when you look at the transaction for PayPal, is about $2. You look at Bitcoin at the rate of this particular data, it was $14. It would make no sense to say, the only thing I'm using for blockchain is basically to take my movie and sell it to the consumer. Th there are bigger benefits of it. Uh, you know, as I talked about earlier. Um, and the other part of transaction costs, um, again, the, the way to get around that is sort of to take the cryptocurrency out of it. You know, again, look at it as a distributed database uh, where you're recording the transactions, but it's not necessarily related to token prices. The other problem is blockchain data has to be stored for eternity. So you've got to take a look at that and say, I want to pay for that up front, and there's ways to estimate what that would be. You just have to negotiate that up front. 51% attack, in other words, if someone has a piece of technology that records the transactions you know, faster than everyone else and they're a bad player, there are ways that they can say, hey, this is what happened. In other words, I go back to my agent situation and if everyone involved in this uh, said, yes, these people had a transaction, but there was one player that wasn't necessarily, um, you know, forthright, they could say, no, he didn't record it, you know, I sold this script to someone else. So this would be the double sell scenario. Uh, so ways to get around that is to make the blockchain very large, uh, have it governed by many different folks instead of just a handful, and just have the total compute power of the blockchain network larger than any one individual or group can make it. As you can see, this just recently happened. Um, and, and the other thing is, if it's a very large thing, it's cost prohibitive. So, you know, right now for an hour attack on Bitcoin, it costs you half a million dollars. Uh, for Bitcoin, a smaller blockchain thing, about $557 per hour. 
So again, if I had nothing to do and I want to attack these guys, it's pretty you know effective. So make the network very large to make it a cost prohibitive. Uh, I'm running out of time here, but uh, hard and soft forks. So again, when, when you're looking at blockchain, it's a, it's a community thing, right? Uh, so a soft fork is a minor change in the blockchain. Uh, in other words, a GUI or something like that. A hard fork is an absolute change in that blockchain theory of how they do things. So the, ba the best way to get around something uh, you know, changing is basically have the user group, you know, Hollywood Post, uh, basically say, here's what we want to do you know, with this particular blockchain. This is what we all agree on and have everyone in that agreement and negotiate an optimal solutions of where you want to go. So the guys that are you know, basically verifying these transactions don't go off on a tangent and do something that, that you're not interested in. Um, garbage in, garbage out. Um, just like any database, you have to flag the guys putting in bad stuff and get them out of the group. And uh, basically, you go through the identification process of who are those folks identifying this data, who's verifying that these transactions were happen happening, and just tie it down and basically flag them if they're not uh, doing their job well uh, or they shouldn't be members and get them out. And basically have stricter data protection regulations, and that's where something you can come in with specific standards on how to do this. Um, let's see, is it right for you? I, I think you have to look at a few things. You know, one, can you do what you need to do with a database? Do you need a blockchain? And it comes down to are you dealing with a bunch of parties that don't trust each other, or are you dealing with a party that does trust, uh, and then just use a database? Um, again, can we use blockchain for different business models like I talked about? Can you do back-end payment of these folks uh, with a blockchain? And um, you know, can you use it to control the metadata and, and sell the metadata of a movie uh, to a telco or someone else? Again, blockchain allows you to do that sort of stuff. And you know, as, as Eric's working on and a few other folks, can blockchain help and provide better DRM solution than we currently have? Questions? Got a minute and 30 left, so. Is everyone leaving or are they asking questions? Mr. Cohen. What? One, one question, Mr. Cohen, decline. I'll, I'll try to make it a good question. Make, so, make it a kind question. So in your high-level diagram, you talked about public and private keys. Yes. And in, in the movie business, we collaborate and share a lot. Who is the arbiter of allowing at which point different people get key, private and public keys and who controls uh, who can see what? That's question number one. And question number two, with the blockchain where you're working for free in the hope that you're going to get some money at the back end, how is that blockchain tracking and, and, and getting back to those people who work for free and telling, oh, well, you're going to make 32 cents because we sold it on YouTube? Okay, two-part question, so I'll, so I'll answer that. Uh, first part is it's how you design that particular blockchain. Those folks would determine who comes in, who comes out, and what those rules are. So if that's an MPAA coming together, if it's a studios coming together, or if it's a group of independent studios, that group would determine those rule sets. And the last part, again, that group would determine, is this public, you know, is it a website that everyone can check into that would know it? 17 seconds left, how's that? <laughs> and uh, let's see, last one. There you go. It's my uh, email and Twitter if you got questions. Thanks. Thank you for watching. If you enjoyed this video, please tap the like button and also subscribe to our channel to receive notifications when we add new content. For more information about us, please visit simpty.org. We'll see you next time.